this is going to be the sort of more pure math interlude. Uh, but there is, there is a link to modeling, right? Because the idea, <laughs> do I really have to justify it? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> there, there is a link to modeling because the idea is, you, you know, you, you, you take a system that has some non-trivial kind of small scale behavior. Like one example is the one we saw in a CS talk actually, right? I mean, so you had this material that was actually not homogeneous uh, at small scale, so you have some kind of micro scale. Um, but then you're really interested at modeling or simulating or whatever, what happens at larger scales, but you don't want to do that by actually resolving the small scale. Right? And so you want to have some kind of good idea of you know, what sort of thing do you expect to see at large scales? Um, in situations where things are just periodic at small scales, of course, everything sort of homogenizes out and you end up seeing an effective sort of constant behavior at large scales. So in this case, for example, uh, in a CS case, well, you have this microstructure in the diffusion coefficient and then at large scales that translates into some effective diffusivity, which is sort of complicated to compute. It's not just some average of the small scale diffusivity, but there is a sort of constant, if you want, effective diffusivity tensor uh, that governs the behavior at large scales. Um, what I'm more interested in here is what happens if the behavior at small scales is not just like periodic, but is actually random and the periodicity is replaced by stationarity, okay? So it kind of looks the same everywhere, but only in the statistical sense. Um, and the interesting situation is the one where when you look at it at large scales, you still have some randomness surviving, okay? So the behavior at large scales is not just constant or something, but there's actually some randomness surviving at large scales, and you're interested in figuring out what sort of randomness you see at large scales, okay? Um, so let me try to formalize this a little bit. Um, so a model here is basically going to be a process with, oh, there was a, yeah, great, thanks. So a model here is basically a stochastic process with a time and a space variable. And in the whole talk here, space is going to be one dimensional. Okay, so, so that was the one plus one dimensional in the title, which is that space is one dimensional and then there's time, which is also one dimensional. And it's different from the two dimensional case because in two dimension, you would think of sort of Euclidean space where, for example, rotations, you think of things that are sort of rotation invariant, whereas here time and space really play different roles. So typically you don't have like rotation invariants in space time, right? Um, but you do have translation invariance, and here it's maybe <laughs> modulo shifts in the sense that, so we're interested here in models where, um, in a way, the shape of H is important, but not the actual value, right? So in a way that if you add one to H everywhere, it just does the same thing, so, right? So the actual values are not so important. What's important is the local behavior, so the shapes. Um, so translation invariance might mean sort of modular height shift in the same sense as Brownian motion is translation invariant, right? So it's not really translation invariant, but the increments are translation invariant uh, in space and time. And then we're interested in processes that have some sort of approximately local specification. So what that means, I'm going to give a couple examples in a second. Uh, but what it means is that basically if you want to simulate the guy, right, and you want to simulate what happened somewhere in space, you don't have to know what happens really far away in order to figure out how it's going to move around in one specific location, right? So it's more or less local uh, in space and time. So the, the way the process is specified locally doesn't really depend on what happened very far away, okay? And that's what I mean by approximately local, so it doesn't have to be exactly local, but it's somehow just doesn't have sort of long range dependencies, if you like. Um, and the general question in this business is, you know, when can you find exponents alpha and beta and maybe some constants because of this model of shifts here? So that if you take your model and you rescale it, so in other words, you look at it at larger and larger scales, you actually get a limit. Yeah? Um, 
And now since there's both space and time, when you talk about looking at larger and larger scales, you have to specify how you look at larger and larger scales. So if you look at some very large scale in space, uh, you have to specify how large the corresponding time scale is. So that's uh, governed by this exponent beta here, right? So it says that if you look at spatial distances of order one of epsilon, you look at times of order one of epsilon to the beta. Um, and then this exponent alpha here governs, if you want, the size of the fluctuations that you expect to see over these scales, right? And of course, you want to choose these in such a way that you get an interesting limit, right? I mean, of course, if you take alpha too big, you just get zero, and that's not interesting. Um, and in particular, you also want to get a random limit. So in many cases, if you didn't do that, there would be a choice of exponents so that you just converge to like constant times t, and that's not considered interesting either. Okay, so you subtract that sort of behavior. If you want, you can think of this as some sort of law of large numbers, and you're really interested in the central limit theorem part and not the law of large numbers part, okay? Right. Um, and so just a bit of terminology. So that's a sort of physics terminology. So what physicists call a universality class here is the collection of all models that have the same limit for the same exponents. Okay, so that's a universality class. Uh, so for example, in one, if there was no space, one possible limit of that type would be Brownian motion. Right? So if you take anything like a random walk, you rescale it diffusively, so then the exponent here would be a half, uh, and the limit that you would get is Brownian motion. And it doesn't really matter what kind of random walk you start from, you always get Brownian motion. And so the universality class of Brownian motion includes all possible random walks, but it includes lots of things that vaguely behave like random walks and that still converge to Brownian motion when you rescale them. Okay? Um, right, so here is the first example of the sort of thing you can have in mind, right? So, so this here is a model where the, uh, so the space is actually discrete, uh, so your function just goes from integers times real to integers, and what happens is that at every point in space, um, you have a little sort of Poisson process or you have like a clock with exponentially distributed alarm ringing times. And whenever a clock rings at one of these locations, so say the clock rings here, um, then you look at that point and you see, well, here you see it's a local maximum. And so since it's a local maximum, you turn it into a local minimum. And so say the next time it rings here, and here it's a local minimum, and what you do is you flip it around, you turn it into a local maximum. Uh, if it rings here, well, then it's neither local minimum nor local maximum. You can't do any of these two moves. You just do nothing. Okay? Um, and so here there's a sort of very well-known theorem. So that sort of goes back to way back. Um, just in this, for this particular example, for example, the uh, the exponents you have to choose are a half and two. So it's kind of diffusive in terms of the size of the fluctuations. So that one half is a bit like the Brownian motion a half. And that one half is actually also, I mean, that two, you can also view it as kind of a one half. So in some sense, it's diffusive in both directions. And the theorem says that, well, this guy here, if you rescale it according to these exponents, then there is a limit. And the limit is called the Edwards-Wilkinson model in the uh, physics literature, or the stochastic heat equation in the math literature. Uh, and it's just, you can describe it like this. So it's essentially, this, so now, you know, by the time you've taken a limit like this, this discrete space has become continuous space. Uh, so this guy now is defined on R times R with values in R. Um, and it just solves a heat equation with space-time white noise. So this is space-time white noise. So it's a Gaussian process with delta covariances in space and time. Um, and well, it has a bunch of symmetries. So for example, this guy, of course, it's still translation invariant, but it actually has extra symmetries. So it's symmetry, symmetric and the x goes to minus x as this process is. So if you just flip it around like that, you get the same process. If you run time backwards, you also get the same process. And if you just flip, if you flip it like that, you also get the same process. So there are kind of three directions in which you can possibly flip that guy. 
And in all cases, you actually get exactly the same guy back. So it's uh, symmetric under all three flips that you can do. Um, so I can show you what that guy looks like. So that guy looks like this. Okay, so that's a simulation of, well, here I'm actually simulating the discrete process. It's just that I take a grid of like 2,000 grid points or something, and I run the simulation reasonably fast. And so you see something that looks more or less continuous. Um, and, well, as a function of x for fixed time, it sort of looks like a brand new motion. And that's what it is, actually. You can prove that. Um, and so that's also where this exponent a half comes from, right? So that's the self-similarity exponent for brand new motion, for example. Whereas in time, it actually moves faster, if you want. So in time, the self-similarity exponent is a quarter, which is really the a half divided by the two that comes from the time scaling. Okay, so that's the first example. So here's another example. So that's an example that uh, physicists like a lot, which is called the ballistic deposition model. And so it's again discrete. And this time you should think of the uh, dynamic like this. So instead of, okay, so the function here, you should really think of the process as describing sort of a pile of bricks that pile up. Um, but then you can still view it as a function from the integers to the integers, but just looking at the position of the highest brick at every point, right? So at every point you have a bunch of bricks that are piled up and there's one of them that's the highest one. So that's the value of H. Um, and the way the thing, the evolution goes, so it's sort of similar to what happens before. So at every point, again, you have these clocks. <coughs> if the clock rings somewhere, uh, then you think of a brick falling down from the sky at that location. And they just pile up like this. But, uh, so in this case, for example, the bricks are kind of sticky, okay? So in this case, the brick falls down to the sky, but it's sticky, so it actually sticks to the neighbor here, okay? So they can form overhangs. Uh, so here, again, it comes down. Here, it forms an overhang, okay? Now, <clears throat> okay, so it looks somewhat vaguely similar to the previous model, right? Um, the conjecture here is that if you want to get a limit, so if you look at this guy at very large scales, then the correct way of rescaling it is not with exponent a half and two, but with exponent a half and three half, which is different from before. So the height fluctuation exponent is the same, but the time exponent is different. So it's three half instead of two. Um, and the limit is conjectured to be an object which people call the KPZ fixed point. So that's named after Kardar, Parisi, and Zhang, who sort of came up. So they derived these exponents back in the mid-80s. Mid um, and this is surprisingly difficult. So this is still a conjecture, and it's going to remain a conjecture for a pretty long time. Um, because even, you know, a characterization, and in the previous case, I could describe the limit very easily. It was just heat equation with white noise. Okay. So here, that KPZ fixed point guy, uh, there is a full characterization of it, but that actually has only been obtained last year. Um, and I don't, you don't want to see it. Right? I mean, it, <laughs> you can't write down like an equation or something. Okay, so it's a very indirect, very complicated characterization. It's somewhat, it's explicit in the sense that you have a sort of explicit formula for some kind of strange type of Laplace transform of some kind of transition probabilities, but the formula is along the lines of, you know, here is this crazy procedure that allows you to build a crazy operator and then this probability here is given by the Fredholm determinant of the operator that you just built. So it, it goes along these lines, right? So it's, it's not a one-line characterization. Okay? Um, it still has some additional symmetry, so it's still obviously symmetric on the x goes to minus x, right? This time if, you time, if you run time backwards, you don't get the same guy back. Microscopically, you, get, you clearly see the difference between running time forward and backward. Um, the limit actually still has a symmetry, which is that if you simultaneously run time backwards and also flip the process like that, so flip h into minus h, then you actually do get the same process back. 
Uh, but if you just do it separately, you don't get the same process back. Yeah? So let me show you a simulation of this guy. Right? So here, whoops. Okay, so you have this, right? So you have these bricks. They kind of, you don't see them falling down, but they pile up and you see they form these overhangs. Um, and you know, you can zoom out and you see these bricks, they kind of grow and they grow faster and faster and so you get something like that. Um, and here again, okay, so the difference between this and what you saw before, so at fixed time, the scaling exponent in space is still a half and so you actually still see basically a Brownian motion here at fixed time. Um, there's some sort of a bug which makes that thing uh, move out. Uh, let me just reset it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the dynamic is different, and the one way you see the difference is that here, whenever you have a little hill, you kind of see the hill expanding sideways. Uh, whereas before, you know, if you think about, if you if you know what to look for, right? Whenever you see sort of a little hill growing, then you actually see it sort of expanding out, uh, and whenever there's a there's a hole, it sort of fills in. Uh, whereas in the previous simulation, this guy here, it really just fluctuates sort of vertically, but it doesn't have this horizontal kind of motion. Right? Whereas the other guy really had some sort of horizontal type motion. Okay, so you, really, you can kind of, from a fixed screenshot, you could not distinguish them. Both of them look like brand new motion. The dynamic is different. Okay. Uh, So, right. Okay, so what's the common property? So what's the sort of, okay, so here I gave you two examples. Both of them do have limits at large scales. They are non-trivial limits. Uh, it's a sort of simple limit in the first example. It's a complicated limit in the second one. What sort of properties, what, you know, what sort of limits can you expect to get? So, well, obviously, if I started from stuff which is translation invariant, I expect the limit to be translation invariant. Uh, that won't change. Now, I started from models that had specifications that were more or less local, uh, and then I take a scaling limit, so more or less local becomes strictly local by the time you've taken the scaling limit, right? Because anything which is sort of order one distances has become zero by the time you've scaled out to infinity. Um, and that's actually, so you can formalize this, uh, and so that's a property called the space-time Markov property, so probably most of you are familiar with the usual Markov property in time, which sort of says you have an evolution so that the sort of future evolution conditioned on the past, uh, well, conditioned on the present is independent of the past, so on. Um, here it's the same, but in space-time. In the sense that if you take a region of space-time and you look at the evolution outside of a region of space-time, uh, it only depends on the boundary of that region and not on everything that you see inside the region, right? So, in the, so that sort of tells you that in, in some sense information gets transmitted locally and so you always can see that information by only observing the boundary and you don't have to sort of look at the bulk. Um, and then, of course, since you obtained these guys as scaling limits, you know, since they were obtained as a limit under an operation of rescaling, so they themselves, basically by definition, have to be invariant under the same operation of rescaling. Right? So H itself has to be strictly uh, scale invariant. So if you rescale H, you have to get exactly the same guy back. Okay? Now, okay, so one can, in both of these examples, one can check that the limits that I gave you have all of these properties. Um, and it turns out that these are extremely strong constraints. So in this one plus one dimension, basically people didn't really know any example except for the two examples that I just gave you. Right? So it's not like if you come up with your favorite other model which has similar flavor to one of the two models that I just gave you, well, sort of a 99% chance that if you rescale it and look at the large scale behavior, either you see something trivial, which is like white noise or zero or something, uh, but if you see something non-trivial, 
there's 99% chance that what you see will be one of the two possible limits that I showed you on the two previous slides. And there's basically not much else. Okay, so there's a lot of, this gives you enormous rigidity of what possible limits you can actually get. Uh, for example, if you forget about, spa about space and you ask yourself what sort of processes of time have these properties, so a scale invariant, the Markov property, and also stationary, uh, then that's essentially the definition of a stable Levy process. So there's a kind of well understood family of processes, and that's just a one parameter family, and that's the only ones that there exist. Right? So, it's, uh, so it defines a kind of very small family of processes uh, in time. In space time, basically, we have no clue. Okay? So there's a very special case, which is the one if there's no time but only space and space happens to be two-dimensional, and you impose also rotation invariance, uh, and then you impose that sort of locally, so you want rotation invariance and scale invariance, but in a kind of local way, which means that you actually want some kind of conformal invariance. Um, then this is relatively well understood, and it's what's called conformal field theories. And again, it's a, there's a one-parameter family of them, and they're parameterized by something called the central charge which in some sense is like the Levy exponent for the alpha-stable Levy processes. But these are already much, much, much more complicated objects, and sort of as fields, they are not very well understood at all either, actually. It's pretty much only one of them which was constructed, actually. Okay, so we know, okay, the upshot here is that it's interesting to understand the large-scale behavior of these kind of processes, they should, you know, the possible limits you expect to obtain are, you know, processes that have these properties, and there are just very few of them. Okay? So we, we don't know of many examples. Um, and so here is a sort of cartoon picture, which is that, so what people generally sort of expect to happen in one, and one, dimen one plus one dimension is that, well, there are these two models. There's the Edward Wilkinson model, right? Heat equation plus white noise. There's this KPZ fixed point, which crazy Fred Home determinant stuff. Um, and then if you take an arbitrary model and you zoom out, so here, arrow, so here the screen is space of all possible models. The arrow is the operation of zooming out. Then, well, basically you converge either to that guy or to that guy. But most of the time, you'll actually converge to that guy. Right? So, the, uh, so what you see in practice is that if you take a model which converges to that guy and you perturb it in some way that typically sort of breaks the h goes to minus h symmetry or so, uh, then you immediately end up with a model that converges to that guy. So in some sense, that guy, you expect it to be like more universal than that one in the sense that it's more sort of unconditionally stable in a way. Um, now you can ask, now this sort of looks like a dynamical system picture with two fixed points uh, and one of them is more stable than the other one. And so that of course suggests that there's something like maybe like a heteroclinic orbit that kind of connects these two. So what would that be? So that would be a model which has the property that if you zoom out, it converges to this KPZ fixed point, and if you zoom in, so at small scales, it looks like this edwards wilkinson model. Um, and again, here the conjecture is that, so there's a sort of universality conjecture which says that there is exactly one model corresponding to this red line, and that's a model called the KPZ equation. Okay, so that's some nonlinear stochastic PD. I don't want to write down. It's sort of a known model, if you want. Uh, and there's a conjecture which says that there exists only one, which is sort of, okay, the screen is two-dimensional, so clearly there can only be one line that connects two points, but it's really supposed to be a cartoon for the space of all possible models, which is infinite dimensional, right? And in infinite dimensions, there are many ways in which you can connect two points. So the, so the fact that they're only connected by one line is a very non-trivial statement in infinite dimensions, even though it looks trivial on the board, right? Yes. 
No, so, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the red line here, okay, okay, okay. Right, so the red line is this KPZ equation. So now, how would you, okay, so I'm telling you there's this sort of conjecture which says that that's the only guy that connects the two. So how would you go about, you know, it's not a mathematically well-formulated conjecture, right? So how would you go about proving or substantiating that conjecture, right? Well, in that cartoon picture, right, so what does it suggest? So you take a guy which is one of the green guys that kind of converges to Edwards Wilkinson when you zoom out, you perturb it a little bit, so that's the blue one, right? So now if you follow the line for the blue one, well, you expect it to essentially go almost all the way down to this Edwards Wilkinson fixed point and then at some point bifurcate, sort of converge to this KPZ fixed point. And so if it's really true that there's only one guy that connects the two, uh, if you start off somewhere very close here, eventually at some point at the, at the correct scale, you're going to end up very close to this red line, right? So just from that picture. Um, and so the kind of meta conjecture here is something along the lines, well, take any sort of family of models that depends on the parameter so that for the parameter equal to zero, it's in this Edwards Wilkinson universality class, so it converges to this Gaussian model, which is well understood. And in the KPZ class for non zero values, then, well, if you parameterize that correctly, you rescale it in this way, then you get a limit, which is this KPZ equation, which I wrote down here, actually. Okay, so that's, if you want, the conjecture which says, this is sort of a slightly weaker version of the statement there is only one guy that connects these two fixed points, right? And the guy is that one. From here, the alpha and beta and the scaling are fixed to 100 and 2. Yeah, so here the scaling is the, okay, so the scaling, yeah, so of course the picture here is a cheating picture, which is that the operation of zooming out under which this guy is a fixed point is not the same operation of zooming out as the one under which this guy is a fixed point, right? So viewing this as a kind of dynamical system in one space is already cheating to start with. Um, but so here what you really want to do is you zoom out with as if, as if you were sort of converging to that guy, but then you go sufficiently far that you start to actually see the difference. And then when you start to see the difference, then that's when you're supposed to be close to that red line. And you're sort of at distance one from that guy if you want. Okay, right, and so now, so, okay, so there's one thing, so what has been done recently, and uh, so partly I've contributed to that, was to set up a whole machinery which kind of allows to prove these type of statements, okay? And so there's a bunch of families of models for which we were able to prove a statement like this, um, but they always tended to be not very, nice. I mean, in some sense they were, often somewhat purpose-built in order to fit into the machinery that allows to prove these kind of statements. Right? And so what we wanted to do is to find, well, a family of model like that, which contains this ballistic deposition model, right? Because then nobody can accuse you of making things up because that one has been studied by physicists for the last 60 years or something. Um, so the question is what's a natural, say, one parameter family of models which contains somewhere this ballistic deposition model, which I showed you, and then hopefully you would want to prove uh, conjecture along these lines. So here's a natural, okay, so let me just rewrite, right? So remember, ballistic deposition was the one with the bricks falling down from the sky. Um, so another way of saying that, the fact that they were sticky, is that, you know, when you have a, a brick falling down at point X, then the new value at x is given by the maximum between the value to the left, the value to the right, and the current value plus one, right? Which is either it sticks to the neighbor on the left or to the neighbor on the right, or it just piles up at that location. And well, it does whatever it encounters first when it falls down, and so that's taking the maximum, okay? And so the idea is to say, well, a maximum when you have a maximum, it's always a bit like a zero temperature thing. Right? So you want the finite temperature version of the maximum. So what's the natural finite temperature version of a maximum? 
effect. Well, you introduce an inverse temperature, and now you say, well, the new value is going to be one of these three values. But instead of just taking the largest one, I take a value with probability which is proportional to the value itself, okay? So it biases towards large values. So if you take beta equal infinity, you're back to the previous model. Okay? And so now you have a one parameter family of models, so beta equal infinity is this ballistic deposition. And beta equals zero somehow looks like a much more symmetric kind of model where you just pick one of the three, three values at random and you don't care about which one it is. Okay? Um, and so, okay, so the question was, question number zero was what is, you know, so the guy at beta equal to zero, what does that guy actually look like? So what's the scaling limit for that one? And what we expected is that that would be in this Edwards Wilkinson universality class. So let me, uh, okay. So now this is the guy for h equals zero. Uh, well, here you don't really see too much of a difference with what happened before. So if you really want to see something, you have to look at large scales. So you kind of z scale out. Uh, and you see something like this. And, well, clearly, it's actually neither of the two limits that we had before, right? Uh, in particular, what you see, well, so first, if I take a screenshot of this, it clearly doesn't look like a brand new motion at all. It doesn't even look like a continuous function, right? It looks like the scaling limit here actually has jumps. Uh, so you get some kind of a funny jump process uh, in space-time. And, okay, so first, well, that sort of destroyed our goal of having some proof of convergence of something to the KPZ equation because for this we would need a model which is a perturbation of something that converges to Edwards Wilkinson, which clearly that one doesn't. But then on the other hand, it's more interesting because uh, everybody was always saying that, well, in one plus one dimension, there's basically just KPZ and Edwards Wilkinson, and this one is clearly neither, and it's still clearly not you know, it's not just like white noise or something, right? It's not something stupid. Um, okay, so what is that guy? Um, right. So, well, it turns out that once you, well, of course, first we tried for a couple of months to prove that this is in the Edwards Wilkinson universality class. That was before doing the simulation, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then, <laughs> obviously, we didn't succeed. Uh, so, <laughs> so then we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't try to prove something which might just be wrong. And so we did the simulation, then you said it's obviously wrong. And then once you've sort of overcome the psychological barrier of trying to prove something which is obviously wrong, uh, then, then it takes you about five minutes to actually prove what the scaling limit is of that guy. Uh, because... <laughs> what you realize is that there's a nice graphical construction of this process, okay? So here's the graphical construction. Uh, so now it's the microscopic process, right? So space is discrete again, time is continuous. So here space is horizontal, time is vertical. And you do the following. So you throw down a Poisson process uh, on each of these lines. And whenever there's an event, that Poisson process, you do one of three things. So either you make it a cookie, so that's the red points, or you make it an arrow pointing left, or you make it an arrow pointing right. Okay, so now you have that picture, which has cookies and arrows pointing left or right. And then the process is just the following. So if you want the value of a process at a given point in space and time, say here, uh, what you do is you just go backwards in time and you follow all the arrows, right? So you, and then you go down all the way to time zero. And I claim, well, the value of the process here at this time is actually just the value of the process here at time zero plus the number of cookies that you've eaten on your way down. Yeah? <laughs> uh, and so if you take another guy here, so the value here is just the value here plus two. The value here is the value here plus one. Um, et cetera, okay? So it's, a, it's very simple. Um, and it's clear that this picture 
as a kind of scaling limit, right? I mean, so these backwards guys, they're just random walks, so they just become Brownian motions. Uh, so from every point in space-time, you have kind of a Brownian motion going backwards, and from any two point, these guys coalesce whenever, you know, at, at the first time they meet, then they just continue together, right? So that's what we see in this picture. Uh, and then to get the actual value here, you take that piece of, you follow that piece of Brownian motion back upwards, and what you do is, well, the number of cookies that you're going to have eaten, well, there's going to be a law of large number type term, you subtract it, and then the central limit theorem bit is going to be, again, basically a Brownian motion, right? Except that they are correlated, so like, uh, so the value that I'm going to get here is basically going to be a Gaussian random variable with variance proportional to this time here. The value here is a Gaussian random variable with variance proportional to this time, but this piece here is in common between the two. Right, so you really have sort of one Gaussian random variable with this variance, one with this one, one with this one, and this guy is this one plus this one, and this guy is this one plus this one. Right, so you have a construction like this, which is sort of the obvious, if you want, a continuum limit of this discrete construction. In particular, that gives you the exponents as well. So there's only one reasonable way of scaling this, so you get a limit, and it turns out the exponent are one and two. And the fact that this exponent is one is what explained that the picture looked nice, uh, because that means that the size of the fluctuation is about the same as the spatial scale, and so if you're on a square screen and you scale it out in the same way in both directions, it still has fluctuations of order one. Whereas in the other two examples, fluctuations were kind of squeezed down, right? And so it looks more or less flat, and there are small fluctuations around it. Uh, here it doesn't because of that exponent one here. But there was another beta in the previous slides. Oh, yeah, that has nothing to do with that Is one. Yeah, yeah. Graphical construction for like no, unfortunately like not. No, unfortunately not. And so if you do the simulation, um, so if I, I reset, well, so if I change beta, so this is beta actually, so that's beta equals zero. So if, as soon as I make it non-zero, if I take beta equal to zero point, say, zero two, okay, which is pretty close to zero, it immediately looks like KPZ, okay? So the conjecture here is that whenever beta is non-zero, you're in the KPZ universality class, and this is the proof. Uh, <laughs> and we don't, we don't have a better proof than that. Um, Except it's sort of slightly funny. It's KPZ with maybe occasional funny jumps because you see occasionally you have these events where one guy, you know, there are sort of these things that run back and forth. Uh, and so that might, it's not clear whether that sort of still appears in the scaling limit or not. But anyway, uh, right. Yeah, and so, so that would be the conjecture, but we only have results for beta equals zero. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, so we want to have, okay, so I have basically given you a description of what the scaling limit is, but that doesn't really tell you, it's a very indirect thing, right? So you take from every point, you have these coalescing Brownian motions running backwards, and then you have to assign all of these random variables, these Gaussian random variables to these pieces of path and add them up. So the, there's no clear reason why this would even give you a function in the end, right? I mean, it's sort of, it gives you k-point distributions, uh, but it's not even clear that they arrange themselves to actually give you a sort of like a measurable function or something. Um, so it turns out that they do, as you can see on the simulation, but this you can prove, and that's not so obvious to prove. Uh, one thing that's much easier to prove, for example, is that if you look at increments and you try to sort of compute a derivative, of course this thing is not differentiable, right, but you can still take a limit like this, actually these limits exist. They don't exist point-wise, but they exist in law. Uh, and at every point, the limit in law here is actually a Cauchy random variable with parameter one. Um, in this stationary case, this is even true without taking the limit. So if you take any two points, the increment is a Cauchy with parameter, the distance, the difference between the two x coordinates. Uh, so this would somehow suggest that this guy for fixed t is basically a Cauchy process in X, just like the other two guys before for fixed t were a Brownian motion in X, basically. Right? Uh, 
And this, we can prove that it's wrong. Uh, so we actually have a theorem here which well, says that this is wrong. It's, it's wrong in a strong sense, okay? It's wrong in the strong sense that uh, if you take a piece of time, a uh, piece of space, a sort of small space interval, if you look at the process on that space interval, the law of that process is singular with respect to the law of the Cauchy processes. So you can find observables which differ with probability, which can distinguish with certainty between the two processes, right? So they are really singular in that, uh, in that sense. And these observables are explicit, and we can write them down, actually. Um, okay, so, so then maybe in the last two seconds, I'll, so one thing, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, th there's a nice story. One thing you really want to understand in this picture, right, is you see these discontinuities, and you have these discontinuities kind of moving around and kind of merging. And so there's a nice story you can tell here that kind of links this to the Brownian web. And so the Brownian web is this construction where you take at every point, space-time point, you have Brownian motions running backwards that coalesce that were these sort of characteristics that appear in the description. And it turns out that whenever you have a Brownian web, there's a dual Brownian web that has Brownian motions coalescing forward. And it turns out that the dual Brownian web are exactly these singularities that you see. So the location of the singularities precisely correspond to the trajectories in the dual Brownian web. Um, and then this Brownian web is an object that has been quite well studied, so it's sort of known that there are exactly seven types of points in the Brownian web. And if you actually take, if you track one of these discontinuities from the moment it's born, if you want, to the moment it dies, then at different stages of its life, if you want, you can link it precisely to these seven points in the Brownian web. So for example, it's always born uh, at a point like this. Uh, it always dies at a point like this. Uh, during its life, it's somehow typically a point like this, et cetera, and there are different stages uh, that are kind of related to the different types of points that you see in the Brownian web, which is kind of a cute story. Uh, I think I should stop here, so thanks for your attention.